Liberalism section. The Unemployed, Beggars, and Workhouses As the controversy between the two sides of the Union became increasingly bitter, Calhoun positively contrasted the condition of American slaves with that of inmates of workhouses or poorhouses in England. The former were lovingly treated and cared for by the master or mistress during illness or old age, while the latter were reduced to a, quote, forlorn and wretched condition. The former continued to live among their family and friends, while the latter were uprooted from their environment and also separated from their loved ones. The apologetic intention that governs the description or transfiguration of the institution of slavery is clear. Yet, when it came to workhouses in England, Calhoun was not the only one to underscore the horror. In de Tocqueville's view, they afforded, quote, the most horrendous and repugnant spectacle of misery, end quote. On the one hand, the infirm incapable of work and waiting to die. On the other, women and children massed pell-mell, quote, like pigs in the mud of their sty. It is difficult not to trample over a semi-naked body, end quote. Finally, there were the comparatively more, quote, fortunate, those in a position to work. They earned little or nothing and fed off the leftovers of stately homes. But however horrible, poverty and degradation were not the most significant aspect of workhouses. At the start of the 18th century, Defoe favorably mentioned the example of the workhouse in Bristol, which, quote, has been such a terror to the beggars that none of them will come near the city, end quote. In fact, the workhouse was subsequently described by Engels as a total institution, quote, paupers wear the uniform of the house and are subject to the will of the director without any protection whatsoever, so that, quote, the morally degenerate parents cannot influence their children. Families are separated. The man is sent to one wing, the woman to another, the children to a third. End quote. Families were broken up, but for the rest, all were amassed sometimes to the tune of twelve or sixteen in a single room. Any kind of violence was inflicted on them, not even sparing the elderly and children, and involving particular attention to women. In practice, the inmates of workhouses were treated as, quote, objects of disgust and horror placed outside the law and the human community, end quote. Thus was explained the fact, underscored by Engels, that in order to escape the, quote, poor law Bastille, as they were properly renamed, inmates of workhouses often deliberately make themselves guilty of any crime whatsoever in order to go to prison, end quote. In fact, add contemporary historians, quote, many indigents preferred to die of hunger and illness rather than subject themselves to a workhouse, end quote. We are put in mind of the suicide that slaves often resorted to in order to escape their condition. Examined carefully, the 1834 law that shut up anyone requiring assistance in a workhouse, in a sense vindicates Calhoun and those who pointed to slavery as the only possible solution to the problem of poverty. Fighting for the new legislation, its inspirer, Nassau William Sr., denounced the fatal contradiction in the rules hitherto in force, which allowed the poor person to enjoy a minimum of assistance for continuing a normal life. Quote, the laborer is to be a free agent, but without the hazards of free agency, to be free from the coercion, but to enjoy the assured existence of a slave. End quote. But, quote, uniting the irreconcilable advantages of freedom and servitude, end quote, was utterly absurd. A choice was required. Arguing thus, the influential economist and liberal theorist, interlocutor and correspondent of Tocqueville, ended up recognizing the substantially slave-like character of the relations obtaining in workhouses. Coming as it did in 1834, the new legislation coincided with the emancipation of blacks in the colonies. We can thus understand the irony, on the one hand, of the theorists of the slaveholding South in the United States, and, on the other, of the English popular masses faced with a dominant class which, 
while it lauded itself for having abolished slavery in the colonies, reintroduced it in a different form in the metropolis itself. End section.